Now Fiddler. Puts on the step, goes right through, puts on the step again. Oh, go pretty. That was magnificent stuff. Well, they shall not really them. Marshall skips away, Marshall skips away. Marshall's still going. Mullins opens up again. Oh, look at him go. He beats O'Day. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Voluntary Tackle, the only NRL podcast to dress more casually than the West Tigers CEO during a groundbreaking documentary series. Pre-recording live from the Sports Restaurant Studios, I'm your host Big T of whom's views are my own. I'm sorry, I'm still here, Eamon Brown, the soul and spirit of the show is still on pat leave. The good news is there are others here who will leave the padding too. A man desperately taking out French to cheer on Robbo's Cox. Welcome, Xander Rosado. Good to be here, mate. Now, mates, do you know any French um, that might help you cheer on the tricolours in the World Cup? Uh, you know, I actually, actually know um, only Bonjour, but, you know, I still I can still pronounce it better than Sean Maloney did uh, through the recent rugby, uh, <laughs> rugby series against the French. So there we go. Well we done. started off with a rugby rugby reference straight off the bat. Well done. Well, if we get into a World Cup territory, I understand. And I would have also accepted Voulez-vous coucher avec moi, Tedesco. Uh, oh, continuing nice. the Pat Party is a man uh, freshening up his Serbian to make sure he can whisper sweet nothings into the ear of his beloved Tripoilovic. Tripolovic, that's how I say it. Welcome, Media Watch Mario. Oh, good, good to be here indeed. Uh, you did mention um, France for Xander, but I certainly would assume he would be an Italian fan like yourself going for Tedesco. Uh, I just think with Robbo, I think that's a stronger link, and we're saying if I'm wrong, but a stronger mm. link to Robbo than Tedesco. Would that, would that be a fair assertion? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'd, I'd be... Support- if, obviously, the Roosters have a very strong link with France. They've got um, Frederic Michelac is part of our coaching staff, for fuck's sake. So, um, and Robbo, having coached Catalan's Dragons, he speaks French mm-hmm. himself. Um, he's, got an, he's got involvement with the French team and the Roosters, you know, famously took their moniker from the travelling uh, French rugby team wanting to play that same expansive style. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, if, there, if there was a side I have a soft spot for as a Roosters fan, it probably would be the French. That, them and the Japanese, but they're not in the World Cup this time. Yeah, Mario. Mm. Uh, now, now, what would you often whisper into your lover's ear in the throes of passion? Myself. This is to you, Mario. Oh, um, I would. No, no, no. What, well, I'm still on the. I'm still in the Serbian whispering love into the Serbian ear. What would you be whispering usually into the, when you're in the throes of passion? I, I would just say, "Give me your best, Brad Parker." <laughs> I would have also accepted, slap my bald head and put it on me a fourth time, Morgan Harper. Uh, now. Yes, any Big T fans listening on my multiple platforms, I would never say something like that on Sports First Friends or Chasing Kangaroos, but the spirit of TBT compels me. I do wear a Big T's T during all three of those recordings. Though. Now, on this, sheet, uh, on this run sheet this week, we brush past Origin 3. We talk relocation and COVID breaches and the future of the game on a global scale. But before we do all of that, I would like to thank our loyal tacklers who tune in each week, particularly if you are here during the Brown this time uh, we thank you for your time and your support now speaking of time and support you both timed your lack of support for the new south wales halves perfectly xander please i told you so yourself to you i told you so yourself until you're red in the face sir yeah well mate i did tell you so <laughs> this is one of those few occasions where i really bloody wish i was wrong but when they announced that we were going to be picking you know a terribly out of form and frankly, useless Whiten. Uh, and, you know, I think a, a probably unfairly maligned, but, you know, poorly uh, combined, uh, Mitch Moses. I just had so so many concerns, particularly when you look at the way the teams who have lost their good halves. I mean, Penrith were, were a very different side after they lost uh, Luai and, and, and Cleary. And, you know, New South Wales, Tommy Turbo didn't get the ball for the first 20 minutes. <laughs> this is the di- the difference a good set of halves make, and you know, without without a, a pair of halves who knew how to put players into gaps, who knew how to give players the ball, uh, we just we just looked impotent out there. And you know, we didn't have a single seven tackle set against us in the first two games. Whiten was responsible for two, 
in that game. And one of them led to Queensland points. So it was just, you know, there were, there were so many poor decisions. Somebody put it really well um, after the game uh, that uh, the selections weren't made on, on logic. It was purely, a, they, they made those selections uh, as a sop to the guys who'd been in the camp, just as a kind of emotional thank you, which I kind of get. But, you know, with history on the line, I would have liked them to have taken a harder-edged performance-based approach. Yeah, I think it's a fair submission. That's me. Mario, what would you like to add? Oh, there, there was a bit of a complaint from people watching that Tommy wasn't getting involved the way he did in games one and two. But that's honestly from people who weren't watching game two very closely because his involvement in game two was very different from his involvement in game one. He got the license in game one to go wherever the hell he want. Game two, he was mm. a lot more... Um, glued to his right centre position. Not entirely, but a lot more so. On In game three, Mitch Moses kept getting the ball, looking out towards Tommy and you know and um, Josh Adokar and thinking, no, I'm going to pass back inside to Dale Finucane because that's just what I should do. He's my vice captain. That's, I should listen to him wanting the Paul Gallon hit-ups. I, I don't know who to blame is the thing. Ultimately, I don't blame Whiten. He sucks. It's not his fault he sucks. No... <laughs> Moses is just, he's a decent half when his team's going really well. That was not a team set up in a way that was ever going to go particularly well. In that, and that's what I was saying in advance. Ultimately, the fault is on Freddie because, yeah, we can blame Brandy for his bizarre love of Jack Whiten, but Freddie's the guy who makes the call. He's, you know, the buck stops at him and he's the one responsible for the decisions that led to us losing that game. Now, thankfully, we had the series wrapped up. But what it means is, for future series, what do we expect? Because once you're a player in, in Freddie's system and he likes you, you're there. So if someone gets injured next year, are Whiten and Moses the first choice? Or is it actually going to be someone good like Cody Walker or Adam Reynolds? I just don't have any confidence that he would pick the right players if this situation happens game one rather than game three. I've got to say... Um... That's one other thing I wanted to comment on is a lot of people online afterwards, when I would say, and as a Roosters fan, it did hurt me to say that they should have picked Reynolds and Walker. Everyone would immediately come back with the, the counter that, oh, Walker and Reynolds have had their shot and they've failed. <laughs> and it, it is just, you know, it, it's one of those things where, where, you know, it sounds good on the surface because, yeah, they've been involved in games where New South Wales have gone down but it misses the context and it misses, you know, when you actually look at what, when they played, first of all, they never actually played together. Yeah, so they never right. had a pre-existing combination. You know, um, Walker has played three games. He, you know, uh, three, he started three games. He's played off the bench uh, for another. Um, but, you know, he was involved in one starting halves pairing with Cleary where they thumped Queensland and another two uh, where they went down relatively narrowly, um, you know, which it was, a new half pairing. It looked good on paper that those two should start, but um, yeah, unfortunately, he didn't get the job done on those two occasions. But still, it's not a combination that was set. Uh, Reynolds, meanwhile, has had a shot back in 2016 when he was still playing a Queensland side featuring basically all of their, you know, immortal stars. You know, he was up against the uh, uh, the side that that had Cronk and Thurston as this, their starting halves pairing. So not exactly an easy assignment. So I think I think people are missing the point that if we picked. Walker and and, uh, and uh, Reynolds in this series, it would have been a very different set of circumstances to what has happened before those two. Uh, they, first of all, they would have been you know, slotting into a system where they already had an existing combination with each other, but also one with uh, the number nine, Cook, uh, who was the incumbent for New South Wales for a couple of years, and also Latrell Mitchell, who was bouncing around at centre. But, you know, as we know, they've all got this roving combination. So, so many existing combinations that they would have they would have benefited from that would have been very different to the context they found themselves in the side last time. Anyway, I needed to rant about that because it's been giving me the shits. <laughs> uh, and now the other thing that's, that's mildly giving me the shits is that we barely lost. And, and I think we've been really unfair um, on those two poor hubs. The, I thought it was an excellent game to watch. I, I thought the Queenslanders played a lot better because they, they were, they had players who came back, which I probably underrated. Um, in my summation of it, but I, I didn't think Ponga would have as big an impact, and I didn't think um, Hunt coming into nine was going to have as big a impact. Although I knew Hunt was going to be good, I, I just didn't know he was going to be that good. And and um, and so I think a lot of credit went to them. The fact we only lost by two, and Latrell almost 
kicked a 50 meter field goal to tie it up actually speaks to to how well that game was played and 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 really how enjoyable it was it was a cons- um, and really still how dominant new south wales was over that entire three games it, it just goes to show that new south wales is still pretty good when you tie you know both hands behind their back because there were there were there are a couple of breaks <laughs> yeah. there that like whiten was running the ball hard but he had I, I, I counted three or four times where he had overlaps and i kept thinking yeah if walker had been there He'd have got the ball out, and yeah. we'd, have, we'd have scored there. We'd have scored there. I just, it was, it, it was driving. Like the, his kicking game was atrocious. Like it was absolutely. Atrocious. Yeah, his kicking game was horrible. And any time on last, or they went left to him, I shouted out loud, "Go the other way, go to Moses." And and I don't know if I have done that since he played for the Tigers, uh, where I felt that much belief in in his last tackle option. So I was, I was also pretty disappointed with Whiten's last with last tackle options, but but. Uh, yeah, uh, I still I still think we were a good team. And just Queensland were also a good team. I'm going to shift off this though. Mara, you're not off mute though, so I'm assuming you've got something else you want to say. Uh, no, I mean I would have accepted Mitchell Moses with Adam Reynolds even because Moses is a good ball runner. You know, put him over on the left, he passes. He can pass well right to left as he kept doing bloody the Dale Finucan all night. Yeah, I, I think that could have worked. I just <laughs> I think we all know how much I r- rate Jack Whiten. He's a useful number 14. That's about all he is, in my opinion. And, and yeah, you're, you're yeah. Know, since he's been out, they've gotten yeah. better Maybe and started winning games. Better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, that was a damning summation of him as well because that the following weekend, um, they played really well. Um, yeah, so I completely agree with that bit. Let's shift, though. They So all three of those games of origin were played in Queensland, which is historic. Uh, relocated there, just like all of the... NRL games now are relocated to Queensland due to um, those kind of amazing things that are happening in the world of rugby league. Uh, Mario, what do you think of the relocation efforts so far? Uh, um, there's nothing to complain about with the relocation efforts. It, it needed to happen. And I think, you know, the clubs themselves have done a good job. And, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't really understand how in 2021 – how a home ground advantage even exists. I know it does, and it exists in so many sports. I still don't understand it. It just, it doesn't make sense. You know, you hear cheering or booing, big deal. I don't <laughs> yeah. care. But yeah, in, yeah. Any, in any case, what, what, unfortunately, the players are doing their damnedest to get the whole thing screwed up. I mean, Appy Coruscant, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> My God. <laughs> I was I almost wanted to time how long it was going to take you to bring up Appy. Um, I, I didn't time enough, you, but I know, yeah. Okay, so... Anyone who doesn't know what on earth you're talking about, uh, go for it. Who's the guy on um, the Screaming Eagles who they always have to tell, uh, give backstory to? Do you remember they were always Pirates. saying Pirates? Okay, so do it. For, I'm assuming Pirates also listens to this, so go for it. I, I don't know if Cyrus listens to this, but but I mean, it's just it's so frustrating. I mean, first you had the the Jai Arrow bloody thing, and then you and then this whole Appy Corusau thing, and I mean, mind you. Didn't, didn't he bring home a bloody, um, he, he brought home a, you know, a bit of a... An exotic dancer. Yeah. Yeah, so... It Jaya just, brought home an, an exotic dancer um, to cheat on his supermodel girlfriend. It, it's just a thing. Apparently, it's, what, what are we going to do? Let's, I, I'm, I'm married to some absolute hottie. Let's break the rules, put the entire competition in doubt by multiple times bringing home some other attractive girl and paying for the privilege of bringing her home. Like, what the hell? Just just stop, mate. Stop. You know what it reminds me of? Like, it, it, it's sort of, it's so blatant and stupid. It, it kind of makes me think of um, Sandpaper Gate in the cricket. Like, you know, you're, you're in the middle of a pitch with 15,000 cameras on you, wait, like watching your every minute movement. I mean, you know, it's not like they're, they're in a hotel where there are, you know, CCTV all around them, you know, incredibly strict protocols and, and anybody waiting to pounce on uh, rugby league players for doing something stupid. And, you know, this is what they do. It's just like, guys, you're going to get caught. You're, but just, doing it, you're going to. Just doing it to your club, maybe, like, you can take that for granted. But when you're selected for Origin, and more so with Coruscant, because it's his first time making Origin, to me, and he, the fact that he snuck this woman in twice into the, the team hotel, whatever... It just, to me, his card should be stamped forever as, as far as Origin's concerned. He's just shown that he has no respect for the competition, no respect for New South Wales as a team, as a concept, as anything. He's just so so obsessed with his own p- 
for his own getting his dick wet. The the guy's brain cells are obviously about as useful as Matt Preston at rugby league training. What the fuck? That's a very vivid way to describe it. Yeah. I mean, the thing that you said as well, Xander, about um, Sandpaper Gate also rang true in that uh, there was no way that was the first time they tampered mm. with the ball. It was the first time they got caught. And I, and I now would have to imagine that this, with all due respect to this situation, um, this might not be the first time that it, it's happened. It's just the first time that we've seen it. Uh, and in fact, there's an alleged text message from him to his partner. And I do say alleged strongly if uh, anyone's lawyers are listening that says, I'm so fucked up. I have no self-control. I'm the lowest person. I know literally, I can't believe I've done this to you again. I'm a liar. Even when I try not to lie, I just do. I have, I had no emotional connection with her. I'm just a scummy cunt. Oh. Now, again, I say allegedly that he's written that to her. Um, that's coming off, uh, off, uh, you know, a newspaper that I don't often believe. So, um, it, even, even if that is not true, it's believable, um, that, mm. that he would write that, which is, you know, damning enough in his character and, and the, and the character of that Panthers team, which is going so well now, but you'll remember a year or two ago had all of that, um, issue with, with how they treated women and, and, and the filming of that, that kind of stuff. And it just feels exactly like that kind of culture, um, again, just in our faces or, or in a different way that we can see because it's because they're being filmed so much. Um, but we're supposed to be talking about the, the relocation. <laughs> Sorry. How, how are you feeling about the relocation? I mean, it's part of it. What, Xander, have you seen the relocation? So Look, I mean, you know, by all accounts, it seems to have been managed pretty well by the NRL. I mean, every, everything I've sort of read and heard about it is that Andrew Abdo has been on the phone to the Queensland government every day. Um, you know, the sounds have been shifting under their feet by the sounds of things as well in terms of the conditions that the families have been put under. So we've obviously seen all of this media around them passing marshmallows from you know, different floors and they've tightened the restrictions so they won't allow them to open their balcony doors, etc. I mean, it kind of strikes me that if they're, if they're all in the same bubble and generally the people on the same floors can intermingle that, you know, and they're all getting tested relatively regularly, that the people in the bubble should be able to mingle with people in the bubble and being able to pass something from one balcony to another isn't the hugest risk in the world, but I imagine it is an optics thing. Um, but apart from those little sort of, uh, uh, you know, media um, attention grabbing issues, it seems like they've, they've done a pretty good job um, and, you know, have managed a pretty challenging logistical thing. The fact that games are still going um, and we've got crowds is a, is a real bonus. Now, I hope that you both saw the team lists being read out, read out for the West Tigers um, because, Risotto, then you were talking about the families being put under a lot of strain and pressure during this time in those hotel rooms. Mm. And the West Tigers had organised for the for their families um, back at home or, or in quarantine to read out their names. Did either of you get to see that video? No, no, I missed that. No, I didn't oh. even hear about it. It was before our game. Did you watch it on KO? I or missed, Fox? I I missed the start of our game. I was on, yeah. on my run. Ah. Okay. Well, there you go. I'm glad you got to slip in. You do run my very well done. Um, <laughs> so the, the yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the 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 mum of of I think it was the mum of Dane Laurie just said, and your fullback number one, Dane Laurie, and then they went through uh, player after player, and and a lot of them are girlfriends or wives sitting in hotel rooms with a one year old or a two year old on their lap or whatever, just sitting patiently, their whole entire lives unpacked around them saying, and number 12, Joey Leilua, oh, sorry, Luciana Leilua. And then the baby kind of, you know, makes a gargling sound and you're like, holy shit, these poor bastards are just doing two weeks of this so that I can watch football. Uh, and they're not with Luciana Leilua. You know, they're, they're by themselves at the moment um, quarantining. So it's just an incredible sacrifice that these people were making, which I already knew, but to see it and then to see the West Tigers, uh, try and shed some light and, and show some love and respect to those people while they do it. They also sent them a whole bunch of food and, and like a gift hamper thing to say thanks for doing the video and thanks for everything they're doing. And it was a really sweet moment. And I'm sure, although the West Tigers organised that video, I'm sure most of the clubs, if not all of the clubs, are doing that kind of thing for those partners in those environments. Uh, i got to find you that video because it's so sweet. Not enough to get us to win, Mario, but, but sweet mm -hmm. nonetheless. Um, would... If you were in this situation and it was the other way around, Mario, your partner is is uh, a footballer and she's 
playing in the NRLW, would you move your family, do you think, um, to go and do this for a few months? Now, at the beginning, it looked like they'd only be there to the end of July, but now it looks like they'll probably spend the entire season there. Would you move your family and everything up there and, and do this with your wife, do you think? It's so hard to say. I mean, obviously, it would really depend on the financial situation a lot. I mean, if it was in RLW, they're not earning that much. You're not sure the husband in that circumstance can give up their job to do that. So that would be harder. But if it's for someone who's an NRL player earning 600 grand a year, say, then that would make that decision, give you more you know, access to that decision. I'm still yeah. not certain if I would. I mean, the, the, the balance of the kids would miss their mum versus the kids will not have to go to a different school and miss their friends and all this sort of stuff. Uh, uproot their well, life. everyone's homeschooling. I did think about the kid thing, but a lot of them would be, on, would, be, would be learning online anyway. Yeah, well, from my point of view, though, that's not the case. So if, you know, just for, just for me, oh, yeah. where I, live, okay. I suppose if we were living in Sydney and going to be homeschooling, yeah. that would probably sway me towards going as long as we could afford it financially. Uh, okay, and Zan, one other question I've got about this Royal Location is, can you see this promoting or prompting teams like the Bulldogs or the Warriors to check out mentally a little bit earlier, um, having everyone in camp, having, you know, it already being so exhausting day to day, that, to, that maybe there's a bit of a slide? Yeah, for the weaker teams, maybe. I mean, I don't know. It, it depends how it sort of runs, right? Like, um, the, so the I mean, team. what we saw, yeah. Like, like I mean, what we what we kind of saw last year was that, um, you know, the the best side were the ones who, who were, um, had to travel the longest, um, Melbourne Storm. So if uh, it depends how the, the coaching staff and the team re- respond to it, if they use the, oppor- the extra time and the opportunity to bond and, and uh, focus their energies around, you know, playing, then it can absolutely be uh, a positive. But yeah, I mean, I can see for some of the sides where, you know, they're already out of contention, they might just start to go into holiday mode, but, you know, you would hope not given like a side like the Bulldogs is basically they've been put under new management. And um, if you don't perform, you're going to be, probably shown the door in the next couple of years. So I would think that there'd be plenty of motive for, for players to want to show that they belong in the new setup. RTS, so was just left already from the Warriors, worrying about mm. a door closure behind him between him and New Zealand. That that must have, w- without their wanting to, whatever, there must be a subconscious thing there about, okay, well, you know, if Roger's leaving, this season's pretty much done anyway. Yeah, so I think the Warriors are probably a special case um, just because, yeah, like, I mean, that was a that was surprising. But by the same token, I guess, with them out of contention and him leaving the game altogether, I can kind of understand that. Um, but, yeah, not, not great for team morale. I think I think their, their situation is different to the Bulldogs. Though. Well, here's the other thing that I've got about the Bulldogs is that we hear every other week about another player being signed to the Bulldogs, which which would be a boon for their fans and it sounds great for the club, but that is also a play then playing as hard as they can at the moment for the Bulldogs, knowing that they now don't have a spot. That no matter how hard they work, um, there's no way they're better than Josh out of the car. No matter how hard they work, um, they're not better than um, Burton. So there's also going to be a huge amount of discontent in that club that maybe not discontent, but also a, a attitude of checkout in that I know I'm not here. I know I'm in reserve grade. Um, and whatever I've done for the club for the last four, five years to get here is not being rewarded. In fact, they're shopping around. I'm stuck in this hotel room. You know, uh, I would be. I wouldn't be surprised if they're in this, a very similar attitude. I would say. How yes do you feel about that, Zander? No that. I would say yes and no to that because yeah, maybe you're not going. If you're a half, maybe you're not going to be better than Burton. But do you have to be, or do you just have to be better than Kyle Flanagan? You know, you only have to be the second best half in the, <laughs> half in the team to make it. If you're a winger, you've only got to be the second best winger. You don't have to be better than Ado Car. You just have to be better than Corey Allen. Yeah, that's that's a fair that's a fair assumption. Uh, yeah, I just wonder about. Yeah, I was more talking about morale in that club. If you feel like you've been told that you're doing really well, and then they buy out while everyone's stuck in that thing, I just wonder if that would have a, a different mentality. Particularly when you don't have a reserve grade to keep playing with, it might feel different. Normally, if you're in reserve grade, in and out, you know, you've got a pass where you can see. Whereas at the moment. You're doing all of this for the club and you see the club going out and buying something else. I think that would be really hard for a lot of those blokes mentally. Sure. Um, and, and hence the possibility of checking out. Now, those teams are possible teams uh, checking out, but they're not the only people checking out or the only teams checking out early, as we've heard that the ARL and the NZRL 
withdrew their men's, women's and wheelchair teams from this much anticipated Rugby League World Cup, which is scheduled, scheduled for October. Xander, what is your take on this? I think it's fair to say at this point, very uh, mixed feelings about um, the uh, announcement that they're not going to send the kangaroos and kiwis over. I think... Um, I think on balance, I mean, I can, I can understand the decision. I think on balance, it, it may well um, be the right one. But part of me also just wants them to find a way to do it. It's just that the, you know, the challenges in the UK, and there's been a lot of arguments put up both sides. I think we probably all heard James Graham uh, crack the shits at the ARLC and Volandis and say that they're using COVID as a smokescreen um, based on the fact that the All Blacks and the Wallabies are still planning to go over and that they just had the F1 and Wimbledon, etc. I think there's probably a few different pieces to that. First of all, you know, Wimbledon, the F1 occurred before, A, they brought in this new contact tracing app and the new rules around um, uh, self-isolation in Britain um, and before Delta basically seen 40,000 plus people a day catching COVID. I think the, the, the sands have shifted well, the ground has shifted uh, underneath their feet quite quickly, and um, I would also question whether or not it's it's terrible. It's it's certain that the Wallabies will travel and the All Blacks will travel to the UK um, at the end of the year if things don't improve dramatically. Uh, given that there are games being cancelled in the Super League and, and other events, they they provided assurances that there are going to be bubbles and a whole range of things. But um, it, it's looking very complex. On the other side of things, they do claim that. Um, They'll be able to provide a bubble um, to support the players, um, you know, and, and all of those sorts of things. But it's it's just going to be a huge challenge because they're going to have to quarantine when they get there. They're going to have to quarantine when they get back. It's a month uh, plus the uh, six weeks that the competition goes for because it's not a short tournament. The Rugby League World Cup, it goes for a while. Um, yeah, it's – I'm not really making a clear argument one way or the other, but I would say that um, I can understand the decision, even if I'm not entirely happy with it. Fuck the ARLC. They suck. <laughs> they are absolute frauds. Hiding behind, they just made up a decision in typical PVL style. They just said, oh, look, this seems like an idea. Let's just go with that. They didn't consult anyone. The bloody Players Association, 70% of players had already been polled by them and by the, by the Players Association, that is, and said that they wanted to go and that they would take that risk. The, so, but that being said, who cares? I want the comp to go ahead. Screw Australia and New Zealand. I'm just as happy to cheer for um, Samoa and Serbia because I'll have Josh Schuster playing for Samoa and the Turbos playing for Serbia. The comp will be so much better with a whole bunch of Australians spread out between these teams, <laughs> improving them. And suddenly um, Samoa and Tonga and Fiji even will have some pretty bloody good competition from these other teams that are being boosted up. If Tommy Turbo can turn a manly team that was just about the worst in the entire comp into a team that's just about the best in the entire comp, then what can you do to Serbia? <laughs> it on. So there is a, a suggestion, if I can just jump in, that um, it wasn't, you know, the the idea that um, the International Rugby League were blindsided by this is a bit of a, is, is questionable, I would say, to put it mildly. Um, you know, they, apparently they were, they expressed grave doubts uh, about the viability of the tournament six months ago, and things have only gotten worse around the world since then. Um, so it's not, this isn't something that has just been sprung. They have been in consultation. There's also been a suggestion that- But hold on, um, surely every, every international rugby league community, the Tong and the Fiji and everyone also ex expressed doubts or concerns six months ago. And, they, and the Rugby League World Cup you know, body were like, yeah, of course, we can see COVID's a stitch up, we're living in it. And, and they're, they're working accordingly. So to, to pretend that the ARLC, you know, had this amazing foresight six months ago and, you know, no one listened to them, is that is absolute horseshit. And, and I'm not accepting that point. Keep going. And six months ago, right, so, uh, the, really existed. I would push back uh, to the extent that um, the, they were, they were um, expressing concern based on the fact that they'd already had players who'd had, had to be under strict conditions and it was... Um, you know, it was a it was a toll on them as it was, and if that was to happen again, then it would need it would be quite difficult for them to go two full years effectively being going in and out of bubbles and never really having any um, I suppose um, it, like any normal life as it were. And uh, logistically going to the UK and back to Australia is is becoming harder with 
the caps that the federal government has put on return travel. Optically, it's not a great thing if we send a whole bunch of teams over who then get preferential flights to come back to Australia. So from a government standpoint, there's complexities there. It's not like Origin, like James Graham said. Um, Unless, so I, I think that... So of course, you know, see the Queensland are, government going to Tokyo to see the Olympics. So that's a different... Yes. Yeah, which, again, optically wasn't a great look, right? Like, there was, there was a lot of criticism of that. I mean, you know, you want to times that by um, 50 and send, you know, basically half the NRL to populate the World Cup teams. It's going to, you know, there, there are going to be challenges there and there's uncertainties. And I, I can understand from a risk management standpoint why this is a concern. And, this is, and I am somebody who's a really big supporter of um, International Rugby League. Uh, I know that, you know, like um, Eamon doesn't get very interested in it. This is one of the areas that we clash on. Like I would get up in the morning at 2, in the, at 2 a.m. to watch those kangaroos games during the last World Cup that was held in England and I thoroughly enjoyed all of it. Um, but yeah, I just, I can see, I can see why this is becoming a concern. And, and frankly, looking at other sports when they have gone ahead with it, um, if they're forced to play with empty stadiums, I mean, I don't know if you guys, you, you don't watch the uh, rugby union at the moment, so you would have missed the, the opening game of the line series, but it's, it's soulless. Uh, they had game one of it's a once in twelve year event. Um, the Lions going to South Africa, and it's just they're playing to an empty stadium, and it just looks like a practice run. And it's it's devoid of all 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 interest and yeah. You're I, describing I rugby they're... union soulless, <laughs> devoid of all interest. You're just <laughs> yeah. you're just pretending it's because of the fans. I, I I set that one up there, but um, but yes, you know what you know what I'm saying there, right? I, like, I, I could mean, hear Eamon <laughs> shouting it in the future as yeah. Adam's listening to it, so I had to do it. You, you can you can logistically push like force these things ahead for the TV rights and all the rest of it, but yeah, I think I think what we're dealing with here is largely a, a sunk cost issue. The British government have committed twenty five million pounds to supporting the event, and they can't shift it to next year because it would conflict with the Qatar World Cup and a range of other events. And they've locked in all the stadia, et cetera, et cetera. So they've they've said no, we're doing it this year. It's got to happen. Just you know, get on the damn plane and 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 work it out in our role. And otherwise, mm. you're screwing with the international game. I, I just, I mean, my sense is looking at this from you know all of the different angles. I really want them to find a way to make it work. Um, but I, I can also understand uh, looking at the looking at the way that you know the the world is turning right now. You know, us halving the cap of, of playing, you know, of, of returning Australians that we're allowing it's 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 a massive controversy already. The French rugby team coming out it was controversial even among French people I know um, because they you know can't go and see their ailing family members and stuff um, back in France. But you know, hey, you can send a, a squad of thirty two French rugby players to play three tests. Um, you know, you want to you want to put basically a, a very solid chunk of the NRL to go into the UK and then come back and take flight spots from other Australians. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot more complex than people are making out. And I have, I have sympathies with, with the position they're in. And there has been a suggestion that, um, you know, to a certain extent, the ARLC has taken a bullet uh, for the Players Association because the players themselves are concerned about the risk that, you know, if something happens when they're over there, they can't get back. The, 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 the government changes the rules against the number of returning, uh, you know, Australians they'll allow again, you know, who's to say they don't get stranded. Like there, there are so many, there are so many things people worried about that um, if, if the international governing body can't hundred percent provide assurances that they can manage all of it, it's, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough sell. And the, the other thing I'd, I'd quickly say though, is the reverse optics because we're thinking quite, quite understandably about, what it looks like from Australia's point of view. But the other side of that is what it looks like for International Rugby League in, in a global sports market in that we can get a whole bunch of other global sport things to happen, but the Rugby League one can't happen because we're not able to organise that as a sport. That I think that's another thing that's hanging subconsciously or consciously very heavily on the people trying to organise yeah. this in England. That, that's that's true, but that's true in the context of oh we've just had Wimbledon and that was fine before the Delta outbreak and before the contact tracing happened and before the rules changed over there. Um, and Wimbledon is a very different tournament um, to to this. And you know the Euro Championships again. It was before like it was when they basically relaxed all the rules and they were you know the 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 case numbers were really low and they were the vaccination rates seemed to be covering uh, the Alpha variant. Um, it was a very very different environment. The world is the world is drastic changed yeah. um, but so my, my point also then is the, the olympics are also one currently and we're saying that we can't do and i know the olympics is also a different thing but that there's there's that and then the fact that we can't 
can't do it next year or any other time because there are there are it's a market that's already filled with other sports. So rugby league, you're not important enough. Because yeah, again, again rugby's I, more I important. Just, Commerce, I just, Commerce games are important. I'm going to push back on that again because you know the Olympics is the pinnacle event every four years. To, like those athletes, they train primarily for that. That is the event that they focus all their energies on. I'm not, um, I'm not downplaying the Olympics. Sorry, maybe I'm, maybe you misunderstood me. What I was trying to say was it's hard for the the rugby league uh, people organising it to to not feel a huge amount of pressure to try and get it done now because they can see that this is their only spot. Because oh yeah, whether they want to admit it or rest. not, the rugby yeah. league yeah rugby league isn't isn't a priority for the in the world vision of of sport. And so mm-hmm. if they can't get this done now, it just disappears and 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 can't be pushed back a year or can't be pushed in two years. It's it's gone, and that must be a really terrifying and, they and really motivating it, thing for them. They don't want it clashing with um, Test cricket in Australia either. Yeah, yeah, they, also they don't want to, touring, so. yeah, they don't. They don't want to. I mean, it's, it's it's a very tough situation. But yeah, like I'm gonna I'm gonna be watching really closely to see if the um like they cancelled the end of year tours in rugby like at the last minute last year. They they didn't go ahead. Um, I'm, I would be very unsurprised if that um happens again this year. I mean, you know that people are using citing that as an example. You know, Graham, James Graham referred to the number of times all oh, the All Blacks tour, touring England. You know, don't bet on it. Is all I can say. I I mm. I don't. I don't see that going ahead if they see significant risks to if the New Zealand government, which is pretty militant about COVID, see uh, significant risks. Can we can we agree with this that we'd like the tournament to go ahead and we're all happy enough for Australia and New Zealand not to go? Yeah, I'm, I'm really I really want it to go ahead, uh, but I also really want Australia and New Zealand there. Like I, I don't think a rugby league World Cup is the same without the kangaroos and the kiwis. Who are you going for then? Because I actually don't think Serbia is technically qualified. They might be able to slip them in and America in instead of Australia and New Zealand. We come up with a whole bunch of problems then with people who bought tickets and, and things like that, but that's not our problem. Mario, assuming Serbia and America are the two who get in, did I hear before that you said that you're on Samoa and Serbia? Are you going to lock those two in? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good with that. Yeah, because I'm, I'm the kind of person who's, who wants to believe that the tournament continues. So... Uh, Xander, now that we don't have kangaroos, dealers, wheelers, which team are you hopefully picking up? Oh, I, I'm obviously going to support Tonga because my, my wife is Tonga. So uh, that makes it pretty simple for me. <laughs> but, uh, but I would say that, um, you know, all this idea that um, all these other sides are going to be populated by NRL players, um, I don't know if that's a certainty because the, the suggestion that the RLC took a bullet for the, the Players Association is that because they wanted an out, so they didn't have to send their, their players. Um, so if that's the case, then, you know, maybe it's a bit tricky for the other teams too. Except a bunch of those players have come out publicly and said that they want to play. Oh, some have. Some have, absolutely. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, it was interesting. I saw Cameron Smith, your favourite player in the world, said there was no, there's no way in hell he'd go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but well. he's also a selfish jerk, so fuck him. <laughs> yeah. Just giving Mario another thing not to like about him. Now, um, <laughs> like the very immature and poorly behaved rugby league players in the game, the NRL uh, has pulled out uh, early and then tried to shove it back in moments later as they attempted to promote the idea of rugby league in the 2032 Olympics. <laughs> Mario, you struck me as an Olympics fan. Does that idea sparkle for you? I love the idea, but I think it would. I think nines would be the way to go rather than um, thirteen aside. I think you're much more likely to be able to get other teams on board. But the only way I could see it happening would be if we right now started an international nine circuit, similar to the international seven circuit, and let a whole bunch of reserve grade players and stuff in a mix start start playing all over the place. You know, and get them playing in Hong Kong, get them playing in. Argentina, wherever, I don't really give a shit. But maybe during COVID, that's not the great idea. But we've got till 2032. <laughs> I we're going to get a World Cup done, but you want to do this for a certain grade we've got, I'm, I'm tournament. I love it. I'm organising it now because you'd hope that, you know, you know, that surely anyone who wants to be vaccinated by the end of this year will be. And then it really will be a case of just let, let the, you know, let Darwin sort out the rest and just hope <laughs> that people who don't have a choice. Actually, it's, it's nature sort out the rest, I believe. Darwin uh, was the, the no, no, uh, no. The, the island of Darwin is where we're sending all of these people. <laughs> well, Darwin. We're, sending, yeah. we're sending, we're sending to the city of Darwin, just letting them bake. Sorry, yeah, I mean, I love the idea of, of, of the rugby league in the Olympics, I love the eyeballs that would bring to the sport. But 
At the same time, I'm not convinced that it will happen. The best we might be able to hope for is a, a demonstration match, which is what someone in AFL suggested today, which was laughable because even to be a demonstration sport in the Olympics, you have to be in an international sport. Yeah. They'll play, they'll uh, play international I, rules. That's what that's yeah, that against Ireland. Being suggested. Oh, God. Really? Yeah. I think a nines is a great idea. Nines is played all over the world already. It's already played in Hong Kong. Where, where was the other one you said? Because Argentina already has a nines competition there. There's already one in India. Um, and, and luckily for my time in, in chasing kangaroos, I know there's ones in most parts of the world. In fact, the easiest way to start rugby league um, in places in North America and places like that is that they do nines because it's a less heavy contact. It's more of an athletic. You're an athlete and you want to play a sport. Well, you can play this. You don't have to be a huge muscly person. You can just be a person who runs and enjoys uh, a small amount of contact. So nines is definitely the best way to go. And if, well, if this and rugby the, league world cup, the Olympics, uh, Olympics, sorry, happens, it'd definitely be nine. Yeah. The Olympics, the way to qualify a sport to qualify has to be played in. It was like a hundred and something countries or whatever, and four continents. So it would have to be, so Argentina would certainly give us that South American. We've obviously got Asia, Europe and Australia. So that, We've got the continents covered, which is whether or not we've got the number of countries in theory um, qualifying. But I think if it was then yeah, announced well, it was going to be an Olympic sport, that might just be the, a push to get a few more people involved. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. And Brazil, Brazil's huge for rugby league. So the, um, is it really? Yeah, Brazil's got an excellent one. In fact, the national team um, huh. is, is really quite good. That. And if they're women's football, they're one of the leaders in, in rugby league. For women's the women's game as well. So what's their yeah, um, what's their great, national team called? Uh, in fact, I'm not going to look it up because you know what you should do. You should go to Chasing Kangaroos Instagram account and follow it because we're constantly talking about uh, what's happening with the world of Brazil. Uh, I want to say Amazonia's, but I know I'm just probably making that up because it feels right, but it doesn't mean it is right. Um, but also listen to the podcast, Rosado, because we're constantly <laughs> giving you golden points about things that are happening. Excellent. Well. I will totally check uh, that. Out. Oh, Xander is. Is us playing in that like guaranteeing a gold medal or can you see another country jagging this nines thing off us? Well, you know, nines is... is, I'm, is I'm assuming it's a nines. Yeah, no. So first of all, I, I would say that I agree with both of you that I would love to see it in there and, and I think it has to be nines. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of arguments I've heard I heard Paul Kent, you know, say that, um, you know, team sports and that where they already have a significant international um, stage to that, are, that is more prestigious doesn't really make sense to be in the Olympics. I think that's probably true of stuff like yeah. um, so- soccer where you have a World Cup and, um, yep. you know, to a certain extent, um, uh, things like basketball and that as well. Like, you know, yeah, you, mm. you've got much more prestigious international tournaments. For rugby league, though, I actually think it would be, it, it's it's the opposite argument. It's... It gives the sport visibility and it also opens yes. up funding mechanisms to grow the sport in countries because the minute you become an Olympic sport, um, you immediately unlock support from governments everywhere to uh, to fund programs. So that's, um, you know, interestingly in, in, in rugby union, since uh, sevens became a sport uh, in the Olympics, um, you've seen funding programs for sevens open up all around the world. Ironically, in, in some places like China, that's actually sucked it away from the 15s game. Um, because they can't get anything out of 15s, whereas they potentially get a gold medal out of sevens. Right. But uh, so there are some potential knock-ons. But I think the, the different distance between nines and and thirteens in rugby league is shorter than that than it is from sevens to fifteens in rugby. Where yeah. so I, I I think it's it, it's an all around positive thing if we can get it um, in there. And I, I think that you're right. The, the fastest track to that is to institute a circuit um, internationally like sevens as soon as possible because you're going to need to have that there well and truly before 2030. There is one big problem Um, with it though. Sorry sorry to interrupt. (laughs) The the one big problem we have is under current um, rules, what's making Samoa, Tonga, etc. so strong is this whole second tier nation thing. The problem is... in Yeah, Yeah, that doesn't apply in the Olympics. Yeah, that's not going to fly in the Olympics. Now, people can change countries with the Olympics. That is a thing that happens. But the process is not simply going to be, oh, I want to play for you, but still be able to play for them. You're going to have to declare properly and make you need citizenship. Change, I believe. Yeah. No, you need to be a citizen yeah. to represent your country in the Olympics. Um, so that, that, there'll be different rules, which is also another argument for why you need that global circuit, because you need the pathways to be there so that there is a local um, you know, production line of talent that you can immediately tap into. Mm. Do you Samoa, see... You, you can imagine Samoa and Tonga just saying, 
oh yeah, you qualify, and you're, you know, that just changing their rules for athletes because certainly um, countries have done that before. They've changed eligibility rules to allow um, successful athletes to join their country as a citizen. It's happened, been happening for donkey's years. You could easily imagine places like Samara and Tonga saying to your Jerome Luiz and saying, yep, you qualify for a dual passport. Here you go. The only other thing I wanted to bring up though is that, and I'm really glad you brought up Jerome Luiz, is because it's in 12 years. So it's very unlikely that anyone playing right now will be part of any of those teams then, Especially which leads me obviously to the, the glary question, which is who do you think would still be around to make that Australian team? Australia team's different, but yeah, Schuster will still be eligible for Samoa then. Um, well, uh, Walker for, for, from the Roosters will potentially be there. Um, uh, Joseph Sawali, the, young, the youngest players. Walker um, will have just turned 18 probably by the time. Matt um, Moylan. In, in 12 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Matt Moylan, that's a good one, yeah. It's so hard to say. Yeah, not many though. Not, not many. It's hard to see. Reese Walsh probably as well. And uh, I would also then think that Ronaldo Molotalo would also be able to and then find out that his... <laughs> um, his citizenship was actually the wrong one and he can't play for that country. Uh, actually well, <laughs> yeah. well, that's all the time we've got uh, this week, Tacklers. It's been wonderful. Gentlemen, I always start the wrap-up and then you realise that you've got something else to say. Mario's obviously sitting in front of a poster of Josh Schuster, which is why the first thing he often says when asked the question is, Josh Schuster, is there anything else you wanted to say other than his name, Mario? No, I think that that was enough. I, I would like to say, or actually, yeah, bugger it. Just a slight tangent, sorry. Yes, I may have on Twitter said, yeah, I was wrong about Des, but FYI, I wasn't. He still fucking sucks. As a he, I, I will say that I was wrong-ish. He is a very good coach. He can get the best out of players, and he does. He has been doing a good job of that. But Manly will never be what they could be because of the fact that he will keep selecting scrubs like Dylan Walker because he has a hard on for them. <laughs> and just a quick mention today, Manassi Finu's um, court case has been delayed another 12 months. I suspect oh. he will never play rugby league again. We had been sort of a lot of Manly fans were holding out a lot of hope that he was going to take us to the promised land this year by coming back and being everything he used to be. But yeah, an extra year, geez, that's going to be hard to come back from if he even if he gets cleared because he's hung his hat on a jury trial rather than a, a judge trial, which would have meant he could have been finished by now. You know, draw your own conclusions as to what that means. The as an amateur, um, as an amateur New South Wales rugby league commentator, I can also tell you that the Finus are a fantastic family and they have two um, kids coming up who are in the Harold Matz, I think now, I can't remember which was Harold Matz or SG Ball, but they, um, they're phenomenal, the Fainers. So the, even if Manasi didn't work for you, there's two more um, coming up the, the, the shoot. And also, I feel like you're such a classic NRL Penrith player that you would cheat on your beautiful rugby league Twitter timeline um, with this dirty little podcast. I can't believe that you'd do the, the dirty like that. Now, Xander, before we move off, is there anything that you also wanted to, to get off your chest or to uh, any court cases you've been watching? No, I think I've, I've ranted and raved uh, long enough, but I will say that um, I have, uh, in, whilst we've been chatting away, looked up the Brazil Rugby League team's national site, and it is the Cacaras, uh, which appears to be uh, some sort of native bird. Um, yes. So, yeah, fascinating. Uh, we'll be looking that up, and it turns out that they, they have played an international this year in which they beat Uruguay. So I was there. In fact, I was the ground announcer for that game. They killed them. Ah, uh, awesome. Until next time, just do what Oppie, Appy Corso would do. Order hamburgers while in Origin Camp and then apologise to the steak recipe he left at home. <laughs> Good night, guys. Thanks, fellas. Okay, little gravy. I'm going to get your tips out of you today. Is that all right? Yeah, okay. What's the first game and who's going to win? Roosters. Against? The Eels. And you, who do you think's winning? Hmm. The Eels. The Eels are going to win over the Roosters. Okay. And the next game, please? That one. That one? Who's that? The Tigers. And who's that? Warriors. And who's going to win out of Tigers and Warriors? 
Tigers. Oh, okay. Big T, I love that. Okay, who's the next game, please? Hmm. Brisbane? Against? Cowboys. And who's going to win out of Brisbane and the Cowboys? Cowboys. Okay, Cowboys. Dragons and Rabbitohs? Who, what about out of them? Rabbitohs. Okay. Knights and the Raiders? Hmm. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? What do you reckon? Raiders? Raiders, okay. Um, Storm versus Panthers. It's very hard to choose because the Storm are in first and they're a bad team we don't like. They are. We definitely don't like the Storm, but who do you think? Who do you think is going to win? Don't worry about who you like. Mm. Storm. Storm's going to win. Because they're in first place. Alrighty. Bulldogs and Titans. Who's going to win out of Bulldogs and Titans? Bulldogs. Bulldogs. Well, they've got to win eventually. And the Sharks against? Manly. Who's going to win? Manly. Yeah. And who's the best team in the whole world? Manly. Okay. Thanks, Gravy. Oh, and how old are you, Gravy? Five and a half. Good boy.